Um, I'm John Lidwell Dernan. I'm coming from the University of Oxford where I work on the history of heredity and I just wanted to extend a special thanks to Dominic for uh, organizing today. Um, it's given me a really good chance to kind of look uh, freshly at some of, the, some of the sources and some of the actors in my period. Uh, I work on, as I said, the history of heredity and today I want to look at, uh, I guess in some ways, a small moment uh, in the history of debates over animal and plant heredity in the early 19th century. But I think that, um, though a rather small event, I think there are larger things that we can think about, uh, particularly in terms of questions about heredity and questions of the environment. I, I kind of lead into my own workshop, which uh, I'm, I've kind of attached to, uh, to here. Um, so this image that you're looking at right now, uh, Francois Desiree Roulon is a young physician. He's about 23 years old. He's uh, joined Jean-Baptiste Boussingo on an expedition to uh, Colombia, and uh, he's a painter. And we have a number of watercolors that he produces. And I selected this one in particular just because, uh, I mean, the context for their research is very much debates over uh, new world, old world climates, the prospect of degeneration, what wilderness means. But I just want to point out that uh, uh, People that appear to be of a European origin still have white skin. People of a African origin or a, or a, a South American origin have uh, skin tones. You don't see, uh, he doesn't depict human degeneration in the art. And I think that's important for understanding what Rulan is particularly interested in, in South America. Um, situating these figures. Uh, as I said, Francois Roulon and Jean Boussingot, they don't appear in a lot of historiography, but they are important in various places because they traveled. And within Colombian and Venezuelan historiography, uh, Roulon and Boussingot feature in a long list of uh, explorers from France, from England, from Switzerland. Uh, this is borrowed from the research of uh, Catherine Pacheco, who uh, works on what these individuals came and tried to extract from uh, uh, the New Republic of Colombia. But he's known, uh, both of them are known within this, this kind of tradition. And uh, thinking about narrative, this tradition is important for me because um, what uh, Boussingo and Roulin particularly regard themselves of are the heirs of Alexander Humboldt. Um, both of them grow up in the era where Humboldt's research, his plant geography, looms large over the kind of research projects uh, that are being dreamed up at this time. And Roulin and Boussingo are both uh, deeply enamored with Humboldt. Humboldt even uh, finances and trains them in some of their work. Uh, and so they are thinking very much of uh, this project where they're in Colombia for about a period of six years as a continuation of work that Humboldt uh, himself had carried out. Uh, now, I have pictured here, um, just, just, for, just for fun, um, uh, instruments that we might uh, easily associate with uh, Humboldt's plant geography. Uh, a barometer, a cyanometer, uh, a magnetic dip curve. These are the familiar ways we think about the instruments that uh, Humboldt uses to understand environment. Uh, and just to, just to kind of give us a context. What Humboldt is particularly interested in is uh, uh, bringing together a, a, uh, an understanding of the causal factors that make a location unique. Yeah. Altitude, uh, barometric pressure, uh, uh, latitude, longitude. These are the instrumental ways we can understand what a place is and what causal factors are operating in a place. It's, a, it's an early understanding of what the environment is. And if you've read uh, on, uh, Andrea Wolf's book on Humboldt, The Invention of Nature, right? This is, this is integral to thinking about environments later in times, right? What factors are at work? And uh, uh, as is probably familiar to many people, uh, Humboldt organizes various species according to where they're found by altitude. Altitude is particularly important. So, you know, uh, at 513 fathoms, you know, we have boas, crocodiles, capybaras, etc. If we get up really rarefied, you know, we're down to llamas and, and not much else. Uh, now, we generally view all of that as an interest in the environment. Um, we're used to thinking of mechanical instruments as ways of understanding the environment in this period, right? These, these kind of uh, uh, methodological approaches to altitude or longitude. And what I've begun to wonder about are plants and animals. Are plants and animals ever serving as instruments 
for understanding what's at work in an environment? And if so, which plants and animals are used? And how? And what are they intentionally, what are they potentially telling us about the environment? And just as a touchstone, uh, this is Timothy Mousseau. He's interested in the Chernobyl environment. Uh, and Timothy Mousseau's research is on uh, the impact of radiation in Chernobyl on, on species like uh, spiders, on, uh, on foxes, and various, various animals. But uh, from my understanding, at least, Timothy Mousseau is not partic primarily interested in uh, uh, knowledge of the species themselves. What he's interested in is using them instrumentally to get a grasp or understanding of the environment. Um, I think I'm right in kind of understanding what the, the narrative of his research is, what the focus is, its, it's focal point. Um, and I think that this way of using animals that are caught in a unique environment to understand something more about it has a wider history. And if we look at uh, Roulon and Boussingo, we get a sense of that. Okay, so from here, uh, I've kind of already talked about plant geography. I'll just hone in very quickly on what I think is important in this. Uh, then I want to talk about the research projects of Rulon and Boussingo and try and really show you how they are looking at uh, species that have been introduced either to South America or to Europe in a, as a way not really, not to take away a lesson about heredity or a lesson about degeneration, but to understand uh, causal forces that are at work within these environments, right? How do animals as instruments narrate an environment and tell us something we couldn't learn through mechanical instruments. It's humble. A uh, famous essay published in 1807, right when Roulon and Boussingo are, are uh, 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 being educated. Um, and this is, the, this is the landmark work uh, where plant geography is put forward. We've had a tour of these uh, uh, sample species and the idea of altitude. But importantly, what I want to hone in on here is that there are problems within plant geography that uh, Humboldt flags, which uh, could easily be slipped off. So for instance, um, uh, there are species that live up to one degree of uh, latitude where we might expect them to continue, uh, as in the case of, uh, of llamas. Like they could, you know, the conditions stay the same, but they, don't, they aren't found above this degree of latitude. Why? That's, that's a problem within his theory. You know, it's difficult to conceive in the case of uh, uh, the ostrich uh, why the bird isn't found in the plains uh, north of, of where it lives, right? There's, there's terrain it could live in, but it's not there. And that's puzzling if you want to understand a relationship between a species that exists in an environment and you're trying to use instruments to isolate why that particular species flourishes in that environment. Why aren't they everywhere? Uh, some species have a really handy way of attaching themselves to a specific uh, environment. Others are useless. Humboldt's not particularly interested in uh, lichen. Humboldt says, you know, their shape is as independent of climate as anything else, right? We can't, they don't fit, right? And that's, that's important. Species that don't seem to, uh, to have this way of shedding light on a particular location, on a particular environment. Not all species are useful in this way. Some some don't fit. Um, another thing I want to flag about plant geography is Humboldt was very sure that uh, they didn't know everything they could know. They couldn't measure everything they wanted to measure. Uh, instruments were getting better, but there were also things that, well, there might be things that uh, uh, we don't even know we could measure but are important. So uh, speaking in 1829, he says that you know, new instruments, I might almost say new organs, have been invented to bring man into more immediate contact with the mysterious powers which animate the works of creation. It's a very Humboldt sentiment. But uh, the point I want to take away is that um, there's a sense that uh, the mechanical instruments that are uh, in the array are good, but they don't give us a complete picture of the causal forces at work. There's more everyone wants to know. So animals as instruments and focalization of the environment. Um, going through the work of Rulan and Boussingo, uh, they hone in on particular features that I think can give us a guide to how they're viewing animals and plants within these instruments. Um, and they're familiar anecdotal points that appear in a lot of writing at this time, right? Uh, they're interested in coloring, variations in coloring of cattle or horses or pigs that have been brought to Colombia. Particularly interested in that. They're interested in new behaviors, um, but they're also interested in changes in size and dimension. Um, 
and they're interested in tying these to climate in places. Um, and there's also a wider understanding that, uh, I mean, within Humboldt's thinking, right, an environment isn't merely just uh, uh, the, uh, the confluence of, um, of altitude and temperature and humidity. Uh, it operates as a whole, right? So there are lots of complex forces at work within an environment. That's what makes it such a hard thing to describe and understand. And seeing how a uh, new introduced species uh, responds to the environment provides a way to understand it. Okay. Um, a quick discussion of what Roulin leaves out and where he goes, uh, because after all, he is trying to cast himself as an early 19th, well, he's not trying to cast himself as an early 19th century explorer, but uh, he's trying to cast himself as an explorer. And so reading his essays, you do get a sense that he's landed himself in the middle of nowhere. That obviously isn't true. Um, uh, it doesn't take much research to understand that he is spending a lot of time and drawing a lot of resources from one of the most intense cattle raising regions of Colombia. Uh, he's in the uh, Cordial here in the province of uh, Santa Mar. And uh, there are about 25 or more large haciendas operating during the period that he is there. Uh, so it's a populated place. And there's a lot of cultivation and agriculture happening, lots of which he omits. Rulan isn't particularly interested in how they breed or how they manage animals. Uh, so a lot of this becomes omitted in his narrative. Um, but what he does do is hone us in specifically about where he is as a, as, a, uh, uh, as a researcher. So he gives us the exact coordinates of where he's looking at animals specifically, uh, and he gives us the temperatures as well. So, so we are honed in in proper Humboldtian fashion on one slice of geography. And what he publishes in 1828 are his uh, findings, as much as he can gather, on domestic animals. Uh, European animals that have been introduced to these, to this square defined by these coordinates and exposed to these average temperatures. Um, now, I said earlier that not all animals follow the, uh, uh, follow the rule of being affected, and that's true. So Roulin doesn't think that horses and donkeys have changed much. He thinks these are pretty much largely the same, and in his illustrations, this, this seems to hold true, right? Uh, the only thing he notes occasionally is variations in uh, 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 temperature of color. He thinks that they've gone kind of chestnut, but otherwise, you know, they are as you would have left them. What's different are hogs, hogs and pigs. They've gone a little more wild, um, and he's very careful to identify what in particular is changing. Um, ears become erect, color is rendered permanent, and the young have yellowish lines on a dark ground. Uh, so he's very interested in coloration changes in some of these species. And uh, as he tells us, in some warm parts, the hog is not black, like that which I've described above, but red like the uh, picari in its early age. And that's the, that's the uh, indigenous uh, uh, hog species. So coloration is particularly of interest to Rulan, and he singles out these, this species as having responded more to, uh, to the environment, even if he doesn't exactly know what he wants to attribute that to. In some ways, that's not, um, that's not key to what uh, uh, the species tells him. Uh, cattle. I think this is an image of an ox. I'm, I'm not sure. You can, you can call me on that. But he tells us that um, uh, uh, skin is losing its, its fur, right? Animals are uh, becoming almost entirely naked. And I think that's illustrated in how he depicts uh, the ox in this picture. Um, a little attention to agricultural detail here where he says, you know, it is usual uh, to uh, prefer a, a cattle that's a bit more uh, uh, like those used to in, in the uh, in Europe than, uh, than this, this kind of uh, degree of change. But, you know, there's, there's a focus on the uh, individual shifts. Um, horses, as I said, there's an interest in color being uniform, but, you know, by and large, horses have stayed the same. So I think what we find in his work is a sense that um, animals provide a means of uh, some animals specifically provide a means of identifying certain shifts in, in content and color. 
uh, in, in hair quality. And I don't think that he's particularly interested in heredity. I don't think that's his main focus. I don't think he's interested in degeneration. I think what he's trying to do is narrate the environment uh, and get a sense of how this specific environment uh, affects a species that's, that's quickly introduced to it. Uh, the peacock is absolutely the same in France. Right? <laughs> Some refuse to change. Some are extremely stubborn. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Boussingot, uh, plants. Uh, Boussingot, uh, upon return, publishes upwards of about 10 articles a year, drawing from uh, his travels and explorations. Uh, I just kind of want to focus in on one series of experiments. He's, a, he's an agricultural chemist. Uh, he has a farm station uh, in the north of France, and he's interested in plants, and he's interested in uh, 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 cultivation. And in 1836, he publishes a uh, study on uh, a comparison of how crops grow in Colombia and in regions in Europe, in Strasbourg, around Paris, uh, and so on. And he focuses on specific crops, building on uh, measurements that he took while he was stationed uh, in, in Colombia. So he arrives at what he feels are some very interesting uh, conclusions. So he looks at wheat. Uh, and he tells us, okay, we have 15 years of data in Strasbourg, uh, and the average temperature during the growing season is 14.8 degrees. He looks at wheat from the one year he was in uh, Sumiyaka, that's the, the, the hacienda that supported them. Uh, the average growth during the season was 14.7, and he uh, notes that it takes wheat 10 days longer uh, to grow. Now, that might not seem like a tremendous deal, but for Boussingo, that's extremely important. Because Boussingo says this is a... Uh, European crop, and look, the, the, uh, the median temperature during the growing season is almost identical. But there's this difference uh, which looms large on his mind because he feels it points to an essential difference uh, which we don't understand just by looking at median temperature, which we don't understand within a, a normal mechanical uh, instrumentation uh, what those would point to. We, there's, a, there's a difference that looms large here that emerges. Uh, he does the same with potatoes. Uh, he looks at Beckelbronn, he looks at Santa Fe, he looks at Pinantura, and he finds a uh, similar discrepancy in how long it takes for potatoes to reach maturity in Europe as opposed to how long it takes them uh, in, in Santa Fe to Bogota. And he tells us that it would be a great mistake to believe that plants which flourished in Europe uh, between uh, 20 and 24 Celsius would equally enjoy uh, the same success in tropical climates. Um, we can't view these environments as uh, uh, being equal. And the reason for that seems to be because he can take one plant, which he regards to be identical, uh, grow it in both environments, observe the difference, and the difference speaks not to a change in the, uh, in the plants itself, but it speaks to a an environmental difference that we haven't otherwise understood, right? It's a difference in environment that emerges from using the plants instrumentally. Uh, so some of the things I think we can take away. Um, certainly, Boussingo and Roulin are interested in acclimatization. Everyone is interested in that topic. But I don't think that's the focalization of their work. I think that, inspired by Humboldt, they are particularly interested in the mission of plant geography. I think that they want to uh, understand environments. They want to really perceive causal works that are uh, at play within these spaces. And by looking at animals and plants as objects of inquiry in their own rights during this period, um, they get a sense of what makes this geography uh, unique, right? It adds to their knowledge of an environmental space, not so much to heredity for hereditary forces that might be at work, but a focus on the environment. Um, and yeah, I think that that can help us look l at a lot more of the work that was being produced in this era, where we've generally understood it in terms of degeneration uh, or an interest in heredity, and those might be there. But I think there's also a theme, uh, an interest in narrating and understanding environments. And I think that a lot of this literature ties into that research project, which we might otherwise omit or miss. Thanks very much.